should have done this years ago. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. What's your name? Shalom Aleichem. Your name? Shmuelita. Shalom Aleichem. Your name? Shmuelita. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. Your name? Shalom Aleichem. So firstly, boys, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and truth be told, I should have come here a long time ago, because Park Bressler is not only a mispal in my shul, he and his wife Nadine are, are, are good, good friends with both my wife and I, and, and I'll tell you that he's an inspiration, because he's a busy doctor with a growing family, with a million things on his plate, and, and I know what he, he gives lev and effort to, to this wonderful Yudhiva, so I should have been here 10 years ago, and maybe I should start visiting on a regular basis. Um, but it's not just the restless or inspiration, Rabbi, but call the whole staff here is, what does the rabbi do for a living? I go to parlor meetings every day, every night, and, and they're all beautiful, and they're all touching, but just the... the I don't know, the feeling that I get is that this yeshiva is a place where you're all friends. It's not, it's not an institution, it's just a family that just, to you speak at a parliament. I mean, the speakers they bring in are usually really good, but they're never good, as good as the Talmidim, and the sense I get is that, is that you're all home. Some of you are from Toronto, some from Mary Israel, some from England. So I'm taken, I'm taken by this yeshiva, and it's just, it's just of course you know this, I I don't know if you boys stay up Shavuos night. If you don't, um, you should know I did all these years. I began cheating a little. Once you enter your forties, you start, you know, it becomes harder each year. But there's an old minig, and it's a little bit of an odd minig. I mean, how does this start? This is this minig of staying up Shavuos night. What does it go back to? So it goes back to Isaiah. The Zayir goes ahead and tells you the Hasidim Harishainim, the early, early tzaddikim. Zayir tells you when the Urim Kol Halayla, they were up the whole night. But why? Why were they up the whole night? So the Magad of Ram goes ahead and says, if you want the basis for this minute, if you want to understand how this minute might have started, he goes back to a Shira Shira, a Medrash and Shira Shira, where the Medrash goes ahead and tells you that HaKadosh Baruch who wanted to make Kabbalah Satayra, wanted Matan Taira to take place early, right away, as soon as the day begins. Which really makes sense. Always reason like demon, always you want to go ahead and do a mitzvah right away. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to go ahead and give them the Torah right when the day began. And the truth is that the Medrash goes ahead and tells us the Pasuk alludes to it. Because what does the Pasuk say? What's the phraseology of the Pasuk? Pasuk says, B'yais habayker, right when morning began. But why never couldn't HaKadosh Baruch Hu give the Torah right away? Because Klal Yisrael was still asleep. And why were they asleep? It's not as if they were lazy people. The Medrash goes ahead and tells you it's very simple. We go ahead and we live with alarm clocks. And every morning we get up at the same time. But back then they didn't have alarm clocks. They would get up naturally when, they, when the body was rested. But you have to think about it. When does Shavuos take place? Shavuos takes place at solstice. What is solstice, boys? You know what solstice is? It's a fancy schmancy English word, but what does it mean? Solstice is that point during the year when the night is the absolute shortest and the day is the absolute longest, right? We know that during the spring, day and night are balanced. But we know as gradually, as we move towards summer, the days get longer and the nights get shorter and shorter. And we know the exact opposite happens in the winter. In the winter, the nights get longer and the days get shorter. So tell me, if you're transitioning from spring to summer and the nights are getting shorter and shorter, you're going to start getting up later and later, right? Because every night is a little bit shorter than the night before. So by the time Schwartz rolled around, night was short and day was long and morning came earlier than people expected it to come. So Sheena shall shachris a raven, the marriage goes ahead and tells us. People would sleep in in the spring because the nights were just a little bit too short. And the Kaddish Baruch said, I want them here right away, so they were Kailus of Rakim. And he woke them up with Kailus of Rakim, and that's why they got the Kabbalah Satayra. How do we go ahead and get around this? We get around this by going ahead and staying up all night, Shavuos night, to sort of make up for the fact that they slept in. That's the message. 
that these Midrashim are so hard to understand. They slept in, and the Kaddish Baruch woke them up, there was noise. It sounds very, very hard to know what happened. I wasn't there, you weren't there. What exactly happened? You have to be very, very careful with Midrashim because, because they're difficult. But I will tell you, what the Midrash seems to tell us is, is that HaKadosh Baruch wanted to make it special. They were still regular people, they had left Mitzrayim, maybe they weren't used to Yad Hashem, they weren't used to being electrified, they weren't used to going ahead and, and being so excited, they weren't used to it. And so they slept in because you sleep in. And what did HaKadosh Baruch do? He made Kailu Suvrak. What was the Kailu Suvrak? Was it only an alarm clock? Or was it some statement from HaKadosh Baruch I want Matan Torah to be so special that it's going to be different. It's going to remind them. It's going to be unique. Even though they themselves weren't ready. They were ready to sleep in. Shinnah shal shachmas areva. The nights during the spring are, are still short. The days are long. You sleep in a little bit in the morning. Shinnah shal shachmas areva. I want it to be special. I'm going to make Taylor of rock. Tell me, boys. Is there another medrash that tells you about another nais that a Kaddish Baruch made that Klaal, that Matan Taira, to remind <coughs> Klaal Yisrael that he was special? Is there another nais, another very famous nais, discussed all the time? What does the Pasuk tell us? That we was Vayich and Sham Yisrael. Where did they rest? Where, where, where did they go ahead and come to greet a Kaddish Baruch What does the Pasuk tell us? Besach de Sahar. What does that mean? What will Chazal go ahead and say? Besach de Sahar means... Kafalem Harkegigas. What does Kafalem Harkegigas mean? It means that Klal Yisrael stood there by the mountain. HaKadosh Baruch Hu lifted up the mountain over them and held it over their heads like some barrel. Now again, does it mean that HaKadosh Baruch Hu actually uprooted the mountain and held it over their heads to sort of threaten them? If they accept the Torah Mutiv, Vim Lav Sham Teik them. If you accept the Torah, it's going to be good. If not, you're going to be buried. There could be HaKadosh Baruch Hu could do anything. But the morale says, why read it that way? Plus, it doesn't tell you what happened as a nace like that, and it doesn't even tell you that it happened as a threat. The morale says, Kabbalah Satoira was so different, so unique, the Nisam was so gluyum, the Kailis of Rakim, it was so different, special, that they were forced to accept Taira. You know, sometimes you don't have to make a decision. You know, sometimes the food is so good, even if you're not sure if you want to eat, if you don't want to eat, you're going to eat it, right? Sometimes the person is so nice, even if you're a nice person, you're not a nice person, you're going to be nice to them. Sometimes it's so obvious. The Matan Torah at Har Sinai, the Yad Hashem, the Kailus of Rakam I spoke to you about before, were so patently obvious, even though Klal Yisrael themselves, they weren't at such a high level yet. They had just left Mitzrayim, they had just left Toma, Memtes Shari Toma. They were really on a low level. But things were so clear. Yad Hashem was so clear. It was so extraordinary. It was like the morale says, Kafalaim Harkidikas. They were like being forced because they really had no choice in the matter. And so what emerges? What emerges is that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the Torah, we really weren't on a high level. And, you know, to commit yourself to Torah, even though it's the best lifestyle imaginable, you have Olam Haba, and you have Olam Hazeh, and you have decent families, and you have community, you have the mind, you have the heart, you have davening. You have, it's such a beautiful, beautiful matana from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Everyone should be able to zeichel such a, such a wonderful matana. But still, if someone isn't used to it, you're giving them a Torah with his kashris and Shabbos and, and Taras Meshbach and, and Yontif and, 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 and what you can say and what you can't say and, and all sorts of things. You know, if, if you're not ready for it, it's a little bit of a hard thing to commit yourself to. So initially, especially if you're on a low level, it's not easy, right? You're coming from a tribe, your typical person wouldn't accept it so easily. So they were fashlaf, and they weren't ready. They weren't really ready to commit themselves. So what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? He created a situation through Kailus Uvrakim, through miracles, through Kafaleim Harkigigas. It became so palpably obvious that there is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he took us out of its rhyme, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes control of the world, that Yesh did the Yesh died, that they really had no choice, that they were forced to accept the title. And so you ask yourself the big question, maybe that it's not so real. When you force someone to do something, you know, it's not real. You force someone to sell something or buy something or commit themselves. Who says it's, is that really the way to do something? 
so I'll tell you it is. And I'll tell you a wonderful Misa, a Misa from the Abderav, a beautiful Misa. He had a Chassid, the Rebbe, and the Chassid was a good man, lived a good life, and he was a Gvir also. And you should know, life is life can be very cruel. The poor person becomes rich, but the rich person becomes poor. The happy person goes ahead and has challenges. Life is a constant up and down. And please, God, in your life, you shouldn't face downs. You should only have ups. But in most lives, there are ups and downs and ups and downs, backwards and forwards. And anyway, this big veer, and he was a veer, and he gave stuck, and he was a good man, and he sheared. He went ahead, and in one second, he lost it all. There was some anti-Semitan, they reported him, something happened, he lost everything. And at the worst possible stage of life, his daughter was 18, 19, it was time for him to get married, and he didn't have a penny. And he was broken. And he goes to the Rebbe and he says, Rebbe, I have nothing left. And it's not as if I didn't live a good life. When I had money, I lived modestly. When I had money, I sheared. I didn't go ahead and act, act egotistic, I didn't push myself. And now, at a point in my life when I really need, I don't have a penny, and I can't look my daughter in the face, what can I do for her? And so the Rebbe said, you have nothing, you don't have a penny to your name. So he said, I have a ruble. What is a ruble? A ruble is like a hundred dollars. I mean, that's my, my entire fortune is a ruble. So the Rebbe says, you know what? You go ahead and take this ruble. And the first investment opportunity the first business opportunity you have, you invest in that. And I give you a bracha that this business, that this investment is going to be matzliach, that everything is going to be okay. The Rebbe is a Rebbe, the Chassid is a Chassid. He listens, he leaves the Rebbe, he commits himself, you know, I'm going to take this ruble. That first opportunity I'll invest the money, and Mashiach, what will be, will be. And so he starts walking home, there's no money for a carriage. He's, he sleeps on the road, there's no money for a hotel, but you know, he has to keep body and soul together. So on his walk back home from the Rebbe and Ath back to his village, he stops into a local tavern and he orders himself a hot tea. It's a few kapikas, a few pennies he has. And he's sitting, and everyone sees he's in there, his clothing is ripped, his shoes are ripped. They see that he's not spending time in the hotel, that he's been sleeping in the street, he's filthy. And he's sitting there at the table, never, you know, I'm Levada, they're all by himself. And one table over, there's a whole big table of you know, well-to-do businessmen. And you can tell, dressed well, and they order a proper dinner with Gestapo de Gens and all sorts of good things. And they're biting in, and there's wine, and they're laughing, and, and it's a party. And they look one table over, and look, there's this Nebuch, he doesn't have a penny to his name, he's filthy, he's sleeping in the streets. And you know, people can sometimes be cruel. Wealthy people can, can sometimes make fun of people who don't have. And so um, they, they call over to him, they say, you know, it's a businessman's hotel, right? So one guy is in diamonds, and one guy is in real estate, and one guy is in textiles. And they call over to him and they say, what business are you in, right? Like as a joke. So he says, I invest money, right? Because the Rebbe told him, you have this one ruble, invest it in any opportunity that comes your way. And they start laughing. Here there's the Shlemazel, Fadorb and Fadzorit. Not a penny to his name. He invests. And so one of these Kavirim, a little bit, you know, a little bit hot-headed, a little bit pompous, says, asks him, how much money do you have to invest? And he says, I've got a whole ruble to invest. It's a joke, because with big Kavirim, 10, 100,000, this is not what you invest, right? And they start laughing and laughing and laughing. And so finally one of them says, I have an investment opportunity for you. And the chassid hears this, he gets so excited. Because the Rebbe told him, the first opportunity you have, you take that opportunity and you invest. And so the chassid tells this gvir, what do you have? I have a ruble. What are you going to sell me for a ruble? So the gvir, who's half drunk at this point, says, I'm going to sell you the best schayr in the world for a ruble. The chassid says, what? The gvir says, I'm going to sell you my oil and my whole oil haba, lock, stock, and barrel, one ruble, you get it. <laughs> so the chassid says, you know, he's thinking, the Rebbe told me, first opportunity, sort of a weird opportunity, but this is, what the, this is the opportunity that came my way, I'm going to buy it, okay? So he says, good, business deal. <laughs> they go ahead and shake hands. The chassid gives this gvir the ruble. They sign a document, actually, because it's a whole big joke. They're sitting around the table. They prepare a document. Yankel Shmerl is sending his, selling his Eilam Haba to Shlomazel X, 
for a whole ruble, and they put in Shlomo's legs. And he signs up, <coughs> Nebuch, what is he going to do? He gives him the ruble, he gets his Elam Haba, and the businessmen are laughing and laughing and laughing. But these are well-to-do businessmen, right? And some of them traveled with the wives because it was a business trip and it was a pleasure trip. So it happened to be this wealthy Gavir, this one who sold his Elam Haba for a ruble, had his wife with him. And she was in the next room, she was sitting with women together, and they were talking, and they hear the laughing, and so she comes into the room. And, they, and she asked them, what's so funny? What's the big joke? Why are you laughing? And they laugh. They're three quarters drunk at this point, And they say, we just got ourselves the best business deal. I earned us a ruble. She says, a ruble, a shmuble, it's not worth anything to me. But how did you earn a ruble? She, th she thinks it's also funny. So he says, you know, I sold to my oilam haba for a ruble. <laughs> and she says, she says, you did what? He says, I sold my Eilam Haba for a ruble. She says, I didn't marry a tzaddik, and I didn't marry a Rosh Hashiva, but I am not going to be married to a man who doesn't have Eilam Haba. You know, we're Yidin. We are from. And he says, well, it's a joke. And she says, well, if it's a joke, why did you take his money? And he says, okay, I'll give him the money back. And he turns to this chas, and he tries to give the ruble back. And the chassid goes ahead and he pulls out the document and says, I'm not taking the ruble back, I got you, Eilam Haba. This businessman's wife sees that document, she starts reading it, she turns white in her face. She says, you signed the document saying you don't have Eilam Haba, you're selling your Eilam Haba for a ruble, I want nothing to do with you, I want a divorce. And I want it now. And she says, let's go to the Rav right now. And he says, what are you talking about? We've been married for 20 years. And she says, I'm not living with a man without Elam Haba. You think it's a joke. You know, we're Jews. You know, a joke this, a joke that. But I am having nothing to do with a man without Elam Haba. And she says, I want a divorce and I want it now. And the money actually was her money. Because he was a Gvir, because she was a Gvirta. Suddenly, this chassid isn't, la isn't laughing anymore, and suddenly the gavir for sure isn't laughing anymore. And he says, ah. he turns to the chassid who bought the Elam Haba from me. He said, ah, here, I'll give you 10 rubles, give you 20 rubles, give you... He said, no, no, a deal's a deal. The Rebbe said that um, I should invest in my first business deal, and it's going to work for me, and I'll be able to marry off my daughter. And, and the gavir turned to the chassid and says, well, how much do you need to marry for your daughter? And he said, well, I need 10,000 rubles because there are old debts and there are other kids and the Rebbe said everything's going to be taken care of. And this guy said, I, I just gave you, you just gave me a ruble and you want me to give back 10,000 rubles? And the Chassid said, I don't want you to do anything. The Rebbe just told me to invest. I made an investment. Sure, it looks like this is going to be a good investment, the Rebbe told me that from this business deal, I'm going to be able to marry off my kids. And the Kavir said, I'll give you a hundred rubles. I'll give you a thousand rubles. And the Chassid says, nothing doing. And meanwhile, his wife is watching, and she says, I want a divorce now, unless you get your Eil Hama back. And the Kavir turns to the Chassid, and the Chassid says, 10,000 rubles or no Eil Hama? And so they sit down and they sign up a whole new document where the chassid goes ahead and sells the Elam Haba back to the Gavir. And the Gavir gives him 10,000 rubles. Wow. And then the, the Gavir and his wife go with the chassid to the rabbi. And, and the chassid, well, <laughs> he's one happy guy. And he says, Rabbi, you really hit pay dirt. I'm good to go. And, and, and they kiss, and they laugh, and there's a kiddush, and, the, and, there's, and there's simchidik, and everything is perfect. And the chassid goes back on his way home. But after that, the gvir and his wife go into the rabbi. And the wife goes ahead, and she says, I'm going to stay married to this man, because there's a document here about I love Hava. But she turns to the rabbi, and she says, a man like this, who's ready to sell his I love Hava for a ruble as a way of making fun of somebody, who's down in the dumps, uh, as a way of taking advantage and, and really abusing somebody. And I wanted him to buy it back for 10,000 ruble, and I know it's a lot of money, but I want some Eilam Haba for my husband. But she turns to the Rebbe and she says, is this Eilam Haba really worth 10,000 ruble? 
a scra scoundrel like this, mean like this, and she was married to him. Is it really worth 10,000 rubles? And the Rebbe says, when this business deal began, maybe his Eilam Haba wasn't worth the ruble. But now that he went through this, now that he was forced to confront his life and think about his reality and process things and realize that life isn't a joke, that he has a wife that he wants to stay married to, that there are children he wants to be a father to, that he really hurt somebody. And you, by pointing it out to him, really showed him how low he had fallen. Now that he had the chance to think things through and to go ahead and do an act of tshuva and give such a tremendous stuff like this, and marry of poor girls, and establish a man, and, and just give a person his pride back. Now his Eilam Haba isn't worth 10,000 rubles. Now his Eilam Haba is worth 10 million And I think this goes back to that story, these madrash about Kafalei Martigigas, and Kailis of Rakam. All of these madrash that say the same thing. They tell you that when Klal Yisrael was right before Harsinei, they weren't up to it. Shira shal shachos areva. They were sleeping in. They didn't get up because the nights were short, and they didn't think about getting up, and they didn't think about gavols of Torah, and they weren't up to it. They were slaves for two and ten years. But Hakadosh Baruch Hu did something great for them. Hakadosh Baruch Hu did kailus uvrakim and kafaleim harkigigis, and did all sorts of things that really forced them to accept the Torah. They weren't up to it. They wouldn't have done it. They would have said yes, but they wouldn't really have felt the commitment. But when they see Nisim, when they see Kriyas Yamsim, when they see the Makos, when they see Kabbal Zatera, and they see, and they see, and they see, it becomes so palpably obvious that they just have to sign the document. And once they went ahead and they did that, just like the Chassid, once he went ahead and he gave that $10,000, he goes ahead and he comes to the conclusion, you know what? It's worth it because it lets me be part of something moral and something good and something wholesome. And once we crossed that line, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu locked us into the Kabbalah Zatayra, even though we forced our hand, it ended up being in our best interest. Because once we did it, we had bought it. And I wonder if that's true for Chinuch. You know, I, I'm a Roman in town, and you know, there are so many schools. I'm on the part of some schools, I'm involved in other schools. And I gotta tell you, I, I'm, I'm impressed by what I see here. But I don't know what's happening in each of your private lives. And I'll tell you, to be a young person growing up now is tough. And it's much tougher than when I was growing up. 11-year-olds know more now than 21-year-olds did when I was growing up. And I see it, kids in my school, kids who go to right-wing schools and not such right-wing schools. And it's tough because on the one hand, sometimes young people feel that society is pressuring them that parents demand things of them, that schools demand things of them, that they're not really up to it and they want to go ahead and be a little bit more lackadaisical and take it a little bit more easy. And there's this tension you have. And could be with each and every one of you, it's smooth, and if it is, great. But if there are one or two or three of you where it's not one gazillion percent smooth, and there's a little bit of tension with parents and school and structure versus me but wanting to be more free-spirited and the rules are like this and I only want rules like this. Tough, tough time. And once upon a time, I don't think there was so much pressure because I don't think young people were so independent. Young people are independent now. They see the world. You go ahead and click and in two seconds, you know, more than, 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 than 20 Rosh Hashivas together on one subject because it's really just one click away. It's a little bit tougher to go ahead and sort of buy into the package and live the rules. And sometimes people become a little bit resentful. They say, I don't want this kafar lame harki gigas. I don't want so many rules. Sometimes it's a little bit tough. No simple answers. But I gotta tell you one thing that I've seen is that at the end of the day, once people go ahead and they sort of work with it and they accept it and they say, you know, my parents are making sacrifices for Vrunkai. My Rebbeim are making sacrifices. Some things might not be up to me. I might not get certain points. But at the end of the day, once a person tries to live within the system, he realizes, you know, Yiddishkeit is so unbelievable. Only in Yiddishkeit do you have a community of chesed. I mean, many of you guys come from out of town, right? You have a community where people open up their homes to one another. It's not that way in the secular world. I'll tell you, how long do we have? When do so three in the afternoon? About three? Let's go to about three, two? Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll cut it short. Sorry. We had, you know, these late to hard kids were hanging around Toronto, right? Very interesting group of kids. So four of them stayed in our home. And they're off the charts, you know, beyond weird. It, this is not a good lifestyle at all. But I'll tell you what was so interesting. Because we had these, like, really interesting kids staying in our house, 
the city who was afraid that they would be kidnapped, that we would be killed, that we would kill them, or they would kill us, went ahead and put a security outside our house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we had um, workers from social services living in our house 24-7 with nothing to do except, you know, look at the kids, because they didn't do anything except watch the kids. And these, these were Goyim who didn't really know from lifestyle. And you know what they kept saying? They came from worlds that were hefkin, where no one is married, or you're married one day and you're not married the next, or, or then you, you don't know who your sister is. It's, it was like, it's, it's a big mushmash out there. It's just a lot of hefkin. And a few of them said the same thing. You guys are so lucky. Because what do they see? They see there's community. They see there's commitment. They see their structure. They see there are rules. And they saw that our rules are pretty demanding. They had, they, you can't do this on Shabbos, and you can't eat this, and, and this isn't kosher. And, and you know, our rules were, they, and then they saw these late to her rules. They were like from another planet. But they just saw a world that they had never seen in terms of the demands of places, in terms of structure. But at the very same time, they said, because you're part of this, you have strong families, you have communities, you have something to believe in. You have a downtime like Shabbos when people get together and family really functions as one. You get to use your brain because you go ahead and you allocate times to Tyra. More than one said, you guys are so lucky. And I'll tell you, that's really this Kafalem Archegigas, Kailus of Rakim, this Maisa with the of. That the fact of the matter is, sometimes you go ahead and create a system and you force it on somebody. But if you look back and you realize the benefits, it won't take you very long to realize that although it, the rules are sometimes a little bit demanding, the end result is so beautiful, the end result is so wonderful, that it makes for Nailam Haba that's worth 10 gazillion rubles. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, you go. Good. Yeah. <laughs> it took too long. You know, it's almost 12 years. <laughs> okay. It's been an honor. All right. I like it. I like it.